today we'll talk a little bit more about uh, mindfulness and concentration. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the functions of them, but I want to bring us back actually to the roots of mindfulness. All right, I take us back into the suttas. <clears throat> at nine, at the age of nine, Siddhartha, who would later become the Buddha, sat under a rose apple tree and with a, his young mind settled into a state of calm abiding, he witnessed the following scene. In the field, a man naked to the waist was prodding a water buffalo to pull a plow. It was very close to noon and the sun shone relentlessly on his bare back. He was sweating profusely, visibly tired from walking up and down the field making the furrows. Intermittently, he would whip the reluctant buffalo. The buffalo had to pull, a very, had to pull very hard with the yoke upon its body. Its hooves gripped the ground beneath its large body as it inched forward, dragging the heavy plow behind it. The plow turned up the soil, exposing the worms that made their homes there. The worms wriggled in distress, trying to desperately to find cover. Other worms writhed in pain as they had just been caught into halves. Siddhartha then realized why there were so many birds that were hovering above near the ground. They were eating the live defenseless worms and the other tiny bugs that lay bare for easy picking. Just then, a hawk swooped down and caught one of the small birds. With its lunch secured in its claw, it took to the air again, giving out a loud cry of mastery in the sky. Siddhartha watched in silence. He felt the toil of the man with the plow in the field in the hot sun. He felt the struggle of the water buffalo chained to the plow. He felt the pain of the worms cut by the plow. It was heart-wrenching to witness the worms, the insects, and the small birds losing their life so abruptly. Siddhartha felt their fear, their pain, and the unpredictability of life itself. At age nine, Siddhartha, sitting under this rose apple tree with his young mind settled on calm abiding, witnessed this scene. He didn't just sit there, spaced out or dozing off. Um, he didn't just see these things, he felt them. He was sitting there feeling into the scene, into the suffering, and that is what was pivotal. In fact, that is what distinguishes mindfulness from concentration practices. Concentration practices like focusing on the breath or on breathing, on any one object, creates a calm stabilizing of attention on a less charged object. It creates a temporary shelter, a port in the storm, a reprieve, a respite, right? But these practices do not lead out of suffering. They do not chart a course out of the storms. They gather, they steady, and they soothe. That's their function. But this memory of sitting under the rose apple tree, of being in a state of calm abiding, and just listen to that language, Calm abiding, no gripping there, just caring, curious attention. This is concentration in the Buddhist sense of it. And then he felt into the scene that he was observing. This marks the beginning of mindfulness. The beginning of recognizing the function of not just sitting there blissed out in the breath or just staying calm, but feeling into, feeling out of, that calm state to sense what's really happening. Concentration practices create a little, a little haven, a little pocket of peace, a little island of relief from suffering. And thank goodness we need that. We, it's really helpful for us to know how to do that for ourselves, how to take the foot off the gas, how to idle a little bit in neutral, so to speak, catch our breath. But mindfulness is transformative. It's transformative because it takes us in for a closer look 
at what's going on behind the scenes, at process, and invites us to feel, to hold, to be with, and to investigate what is before us, not bypass, not just intellectually know what's happening. It invites us to come see and feel for ourselves, but at our own pace. We meet experience and we relate to it as skillfully as possible. It's really good to understand the distinction between concentration and mindfulness. Both are aspects of attention, but together, together they create a powerful tool. Together they create the conditions for seeing and feeling and understanding and relating well, how, how to relate well to the suffering, to the ache, the pain, the reaction, the story, the moment. Concentration steadies attention and steadies attention on the object. It keeps it in the vicinity. Mindfulness more holistically gets to know what's going on so it can learn how to respond. And we learn how to pace ourselves so we don't get overwhelmed. How do we do that? By understanding these two modes of attention. If we're too stressed out or anxious or worked up by the feelings we encounter, by the feelings we are having, well, we learn to use concentration practices to steady ourselves, to take a break, to catch our breath, to calm, settle, soothe ourselves. And we do that by by the simplicity of just coming back to the body breathing. This quiets the nervous system. This resettles us back down in some comfort and stability in the present moment. And at other times, we're gonna to wanna to give a little bit more attention to feeling, to how it feels inside, to get to know the upset, to get to know how do I hold this? How do I be with this so I don't get overwhelmed or blown away? But how do I learn how to ride the waves of this so that I might respond a bit more skillfully? I might, instead of reacting, I might respond. <clears throat> we can make different choices. We make course corrections because mindfulness attends holistically. It's what allows us to make those course corrections. And that is why it is transformative. Reactivity can slowly shift into that responsiveness as we steady ourselves, bear witness, and feel. This is what brings about wisdom and compassion. And this is good news for us. <clears throat> 